it's just so powerful to give that self-determination and autonomy to Indigenous people. Instead of them being right at the back, you know, and left behind, we're actually bringing them forward and saying, hey, listen, be part of the movement. Be part of the social impact. Be part of the change. Hello and welcome to the Blockchain Pro Podcast. I'm Adriana Bellotti. My guest today is Dr. Vanessa Liamat, and we will talk about her professional journey and how crypto can help stop the ongoing exploitation of Aboriginal communities and Indigenous artists all over the world. Vanessa is a Yupungati and Marian woman, and we recorded this episode in the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I acknowledge their elders, past, present, and emerging. Hi, Vanessa. Hi, Adriana. So good to have you today. Thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, no, you're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. It's such a pleasure. Thank you. So let's dive right in and go back in time and talk a little bit about what you were doing before you started working with blockchain technology. I'm a social epidemiologist in medicine, looking at for Indigenous health. And what a lot of the work I do is I look at... Um, how data is interpreted to policy um, and then how it is then funded for Indigenous people. And I talk a lot to communities. I work with the government to create policy frameworks on different areas. And I do a lot of that cultural brokering role. A few years ago, I set up my own business in cultural brokering. Then I saw blockchain as an opportunity to bring all of that together. And um, meeting Tim and hearing Tim's aspiration and, and you know what he wants to do in this space, I just thought, wow, this is huge. This is a game changer for Indigenous people, Indigenous artists. Because like I look at a lot of work in suicide prevention and domestic family violence, so social issues. So when I look at the statistics in suicides, it's, you know, like Indigenous people have the highest suicides in the world. And, you know, no one wants to be the baton or the leader in that. No one wants that, you know. And then you start looking at um, employment. Which category of employment has high suicides? And in the Indigenous community in Australia, we know that the high suicides are actually um, artists and young people. So, yeah, I saw it as an opportunity to sort of go, all right, how do we bring this in to a space where we're going to make this change? We're going to empower young people and empower Indigenous artists. And, you know, and we're not just doing it in Australia, we're also doing it globally. Backtracking a little bit before we get into the nitty and gritty what, of what the project is, what does cultural brokerage entail and how will blockchain technology help mitigate some of the problems that arise with it? So cultural brokering is just a little bit more than cultural consultancy. As a broker, you, you do that a whole bridging of the gap between Indigenous companies, organisations, people, communities with the non-Indigenous organisation or business. And I've also done it with governments. And it's going in and talking to the community and saying, you know, like, this is what we're doing. Um, making sure that I'm at, at all the meetings, making sure that I'm having, I'm making sure their voices are heard. When someone at the, you know, in, in the Indigenous community says, I don't understand this, I go back to the business and I say, hey, listen, they're not understanding your language. How else can we say this? Let's, let's work together because I don't want to go in there and say, hey, this is how you have to say it because I, it's not teaching anyone anything. So when I work with the businesses, I like to say, you know, they're not understanding it. Let's, let's work together to, to work at some sort of strategy and a process so that these guys can understand it. And then I go back to the, you know, like I'll go back to the Indigenous community and sometimes what I find is the opposite. Non-Indigenous organisations don't understand Aboriginal culture. They don't understand that once the trust is gone, the trust is gone. That's it. I was born in the Torres Strait. I was raised in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture. Um, and so... You know, and I've got my qualifications in medicine and health as a social epidemiologist. And now, I, like, I know how to work in the Western system. I've worked at um, different universities and I've worked with different governments and I've worked with a lot of non-Indigenous organisations. And it was also with artificial intelligence and data. So I guess, I guess for me, it's not about... The data bit isn't new because I've always enjoyed data. You know, tells a story. There's a truth in numbers. <laughs> and, you know, as, as a culture of storytellers, right, as well, data tells right. a story. Yeah, and there's a, there's a science to it. And, you know, you bring those numbers in to tell a story. And like I often say to people, you know, like, you've just told me the story with the numbers, but it doesn't make sense. Can you really bring it out and flesh it for me? 
so that I could just really hear the juicy bits of what the numbers mean. And they look at me like, what? And I'm like, yeah, because it's really important. And people remember that. Like you do a presentation or something with, and you're telling a story with numbers. If you just go over your, your graph and you just go, oh, this percentage is that, people walk away with nothing. But if you sit there and you say, you know what? The data, this is what it's telling you. And you go piece by piece and you break it up. And this is how we got to this point and da, 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 and all the pieces. Suddenly somebody walks away with something going, wow, that was great. Now I understand. And, and that's what I do is making sure that, you know, both sides of cultures understand and, and so that we can keep progressing forward. Self-determination is embodied. It's interesting to me because I think there's this perception that the bridging of the education is only one on one side. You, bri you bridge the Western education to Aboriginal communities, but it's not. It's like it's both ways, right? It has to be. Yeah, it is. It's both ways. Otherwise, you're still, you sit in the colonial concept all the time. You need to break out of that. You need to understand that this is a culture that's rich. Like, you know, it's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture, you know, it's 50,000 odd years. It wasn't just popping up yesterday. It's not a startup. It's it's a reality. It's it's lived. Everything you do has meaning. Like we're taught from birth to, um, you know, to be one with the earth, to respect the earth, to understand what is expected of you, to, to you know, you're given totems so that you understand your responsibility to nature and the world around you. So, and then there's, you know, there's moiety and there's bloodlines. So, you know, this is established to create a social system of relationships that actually know how to fully respect each other without standing there saying, I'm going to respect you. It's, it's already known. And so it's really interesting working in, you know, with a lot of these, like with Western culture, and quite often you have to say, okay, that, that's not a good boundary. This, we need to have this boundary here so that people know that we're actually respecting them properly in culture. Because they're not used to it. They're not used to that conversation or that being born with that in their, um, I guess, in their cultural DNA. That's really interesting. So I guess what I'm personally looking yeah. uh, forward into, you know, you coming into the space and the project that you're studying with Tim is like doing my part in learning about what Aboriginal culture is and helping like also bridge the gap as much as I can with, you know, podcasts like this or meetups, anything that's needed. Let's talk a little bit about how are we going to do that? <laughs> what's, what's up with the project? Okay, so the project's really cool. I love it. It's exciting. It's going to change the way um, Indigenous artists and Indigenous communities have control over their work and explaining that to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, it could take me three weeks of conversation You know, and someone will ring me up and they'll say, so explain this bit to me. And it's only one little bit. And then, you know, then they ring me and say, okay, so explain this. And then they'll say, explain how those pieces connect. So it's not anything like, you know, it's, it's not something where you go into school and you, you do, your, you know, you study for a little bit and you do an exam. It's nothing like that. It's trying to connect blockchain and NFTs with Indigenous culture and explaining to Aboriginal and Torres Strait people and Indigenous people globally very soon how that all gels together. How do the cultures interconnect? Because, you know, we know that we have community. And in the blockchain, you have community. So it's combining the communities together and letting them know. So in the past, it was indigenous community, and then there was Western people, and then there was government. And government had all this control of inequality and inequity of indigenous people. And now the government doesn't have the say here. They will in regulation and stuff, but in the sense of working with um, in the blockchain, you know, it's about that community. So the sale of the artwork is not determined by the government. It's not going to be, there's not going to be another wall put in place and, you know, the goalposts aren't going to be removed or moved, moved again. It's actually like, you know, the blockchain community says, well, this is fair and equitable. You know, that's a good piece. Let's, let's see how we can work with it. So it's about talking to, like we're talking to Indigenous artists in Australia. Um, Australia is our MVP, minimal viable product. And um, what we're doing with us artists is just having a yarn about, or talk about, um, do they do digital artwork? Have they, how, you know, we're talking about their creativity. How do you create your work? Um, and then we're talking about things like, have you thought about, you know, putting it into the NFT space? And then I explain what blockchain is and what an NFT is. And then we just keep having those conversations. And I say to them, You know, this is the structure. 
So, because the first thing that everyone, everyone, you know, you can all sit there and hide and say you don't, but everybody thinks about, you know, like, how will I get paid? It's a fair question because everybody's got to eat. And I say to them, like, straight out, like, this is what will happen. We've put a percentage away to charity. You'll get the largest, largest percentage. And, and we, what we've done is we've identified Indigenous charities. We ask the artists to choose between three to five charities and they can put some sort of disclaimer with it of how they want that charity to spend that money. And so it feeds back into Indigenous communities. It must be an Indigenous charity run by Indigenous people. So again, it feeds back into the community non-stop. And that's at the first sale. That's huge. So it changes the whole paradigm, so to speak. And, you know, and part of that discussion is making sure that the Indigenous artists and the, and the Indigenous um, communities work together with us and we don't leave anybody behind. Just making sure that those stepping stones are put in place. And that's what I do. I just secure it all. I think once you've had your first NFT sale and the artist gets their money soon after instead of months after on a traditional sale, people that will start to understand very quickly what the difference is between this new world and the old world, right? Exactly. Because it's being explained to them in a way um, Like sometimes I draw it out um, with the artist and I catch up with them face to face. And, you know, I, when I talk to them, um, they, they ask so many questions and, and I'm okay. Like, I'm just like, well, you know, this is, it's, this is your life. So you should be asking the questions. I think I'd be worried if they didn't ask any questions. Um, yeah, and then, and I said to them, like, you know, with, with the NFT, I said, you can trace each piece. Every time there's a resale on your piece, you don't have to sit around wondering, like, has somebody sold my piece, am I, not, am I going to get any royalties? We set it up so you get your royalties all the time. And they went, what? And I said, yeah. And then I said, we create a community around your piece. And they went, oh, wow. And I said, yeah. I said, and that's the important piece. I said, we've got community in our culture and we're creating another community for your work. I said, so you're, you know, usually you sell your piece of art, see you later. I said, but this is different. I said, we're creating a community for your work And, a commu and we already come from a community, so we're just joining the two. And the exploitation is gone. Exactly. I can't wait for that to happen, like really. Exactly, that's it. One of my first jobs in Australia, I was working at the airport at this company that was called the Rainbow Serpent. And they were one of the best at the time that were like paying proper royalties to Aboriginal artists, like... The founder of the company was very, very much of an admirer of Aboriginal culture, but there were so there are still so many crappy companies out there that just steal everyone's designs and artworks and IP and ideas and sell it for the cheapest price. That is to me that is just disgraceful, and I cannot wait to see exploitation end. Yeah, oh, I agree. I agree with you. It's it's going to be good, and I think also like it's just so powerful to give that self determination and autonomy to Indigenous people instead of them being right at the back, you know, and left behind. We're actually bringing them forward and say, hey, listen, be part of the movement, be part of the social impact, be part of the change. And Web three is all about including everyone if you want to be a part of it there's a space for you so there's no need for anyone to feel excluded because all you want to do like all you need is access so that's another problem that we have to solve right how do we bring access to anybody who wants to and that's not just an um, aboriginal problem that's a problem on every developing economy as well because I, I talk a lot with people in west africa i'm from brazil originally a lot of people in brazil and you know things are beginning to to move but they're slow and we have to help them exactly so with the walk in between worlds you guys are gonna help artists sell their nfts and what else uh, is there an education piece is there a employment yeah, piece how's that gonna there's work four, there's four pillars yeah yeah there's all those there's pillars um involved in it um the empowerment pillars education pieces um so Be, and that education is like we're partnering, well, we're talking about discussions with universities at the moment. So we create those education pieces so that um, artists aren't left in the dark. Um, and, it, it, you know, if you're not a digital artist, then it's about educating people to become a digital artists or how to turn their arts creatively into digital art. So those conversations are happening. Um, if you're a musician, how do we then bring your, your music forward? 
Um, if you're a photographer, how do we bring your photography forward? One of the questions they always ask is about, you know, what happens if I die? In Indigenous culture, um, if somebody dies, quite often their whole image has to be removed. And um, if somebody's put their photo up as, a, as an NFT, then how do we sort that out? And so as we're getting people, artists to sign up their contracts, we're asking them to, we're asking the artist to do their will. So those stepping stones are in place. So if anything happens to the artist, we know what their will says. We know that they, they're okay to leave their pictures up. You know, all those sort of things need to be taken into consideration. So we've created this whole cultural protocols process and policy for walking between worlds. And, you know, it's about working with um, our team to make sure they understand the cultural protocols. With the artists, I say to them, if there's anything you think we're missing, please let us know and we'll put it all back in. Because those pillars of education, empowerment and so forth, you know, it's every piece of what we do. And that's really important. It is too. Oh, I'm so excited to see all this happening. Okay, we are getting to the pointy end. Uh, here come the, the quick three. What are you currently okay. reading? I've been reading Tim's book, Down the Rabbit Hole. Uh, can you see that? I have this book. I'll, I will put a link to in the description for everyone. I'm, I'm in Tim, Tim's yeah. book. Did you know that? Ah, what chapter? When you get to the what end, you'll see, you see there's a surprise in the end, like the little contest that he held at the time. <laughs> ah, okay. I've read it and then I reread it. And then like I, my favorite section is reading about the Silk Road. And then I was reading, you know, I saw an article out yesterday about the Silk Road on The Guardian. And then I was like, ooh, this is really interesting. How is this going to work out? You know, how's this going to play out? And, you know, that guy was um, the guy that was jailed and then he's putting all his, like he's creating um, NFTs for charity. Ross Ulbricht. Yeah. And I thought, that's good. Like, because he genuinely did not mean for his, what he created to go into the black market. But yeah, that's what I'm enjoying reading. And I'm, it's, I'm learning a lot from the book about NFTs and blockchain. I've also been reading a lot of um, other articles about blockchains and yeah because I follow the news a lot and current affairs and different platforms. Okay and what is your favorite crypto resource? Yeah I'd have to say Twitter because I really like share space and on Twitter and having those conversations. Um, we've done a few of the um, discussions on Twitter with we did one with um, what are they called blue chip and it was a really interesting discussion with these guys. And they were very interested in the policy side of culture. And it's interesting because I think people all over the world have read the inequality and the inequity that have happened to Indigenous people and still happens to Indigenous Australians. So they wanted to know, like, is, does this really happen and how will NFTs or blockchain actually help to resolve some of these issues or address some of these issues? And I, and I thought it was a really interesting discussion. Uh, like, we were just talking about Indigenous policy in general, and I said, well, there was a whole, whole policy on stolen wages in Australia, and the policy went for 75 years. And in paper, you know, in theory, it went for 75 years, but it started right at the beginning of colonisation. So it went for nearly 175 years. And um, the thing was, like, people were... Aboriginal people were chained, shackled and chained and made to work for free. And then the government, it was almost like they felt guilty and so they called it stolen wages. Nice no award for slavery, really. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like no creativity there whatsoever, like nothing, like, like, you know. So, and then we've got generations and generations of Indigenous people who have been caught in a cycle of poverty. And I think the, the beauty of what we're doing with Walking Between Worlds is we're enabling people to start growing their generational wealth. And that is something that will change the paradigm. You know, we'll start to see Indigenous people, you know, being able to afford to go to school, be able to afford a house for their kids, no longer living in overcrowding, you know, be able to afford to, to buy food. So it's, you know, and I'm not saying all Indigenous people are like that, but, but you know, when you go to regional, rural, rural, remote Australia, where a majority of the peak population is Indigenous people, that's what you see. And you also see it in the cities. And that's stolen wages... What it did was create generational trauma as well. So, you know, and so we just see that perpetuated cycles of poverty and, and trauma. And then all of a sudden, like I look at something like what we're doing with Walking Between, it may not be the solution, you know, but it's something that can give people a chance. And that's what's important. It's the beginning. Yeah, it is. It's the beginning. And saying to Indigenous people, like, 
there is this opportunity. You can be part of this. And we're going to walk this together. Let's walk between the worlds together. Let's show you how to do it. Let's bring you with us. So I assume that Walk in Between Worlds is your favorite project? Because that's my third question. What is your favorite yes. crypto project? <laughs> it is my favorite project. <laughs> For all these wonderful reasons. Look, the project is a game changer. And, and that's pretty much it. It's a game changer. And it's, and it's showing them like, you know what? There is a way to keep a track of your art. There is a way of making change. There is a way of leaving that generational wealth. There is a way of walking together between worlds. So, yes, it is my favorite project. <laughs> Goosebumps. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you so much. That's, a, I think, a great note to end on. I have been waiting since 2014 to start seeing, like, blockchain technology really change people's lives. And I think we're finally getting close. So, can't wait to see what oh, you're going to bring to it. I know. It. I know. It's just great. I think it's just such an opportunity to push the change through and it just I'm just really excited and I'm just really really grateful to be part of it that's all I can say but thank you Adriana thank you Vanessa okay and that was Dr. Vanessa Liamat if you have questions about her project her social media and web details are in the description for you remember to subscribe and turn on notifications so you always get new episodes as soon as they come out hope you enjoyed my chat with Vanessa Thanks for joining us. I'll see you on the next vlog. Bye.